Welcome to the CDG BizCast. I'm your host, Christian Gonzalez, co-owner of Creativity Design Group, a digital marketing firm in Houston, Texas. In today's episode, we'll continue our Christmas season theme by discussing retail efficiency. What that means is that we are going to discuss what retailers, both online and brick and mortar stores, can do to ensure the checkout and retail process goes seamlessly for customers during the busiest time of the year. From checkouts to returns, we are going to talk about how these processes will go smoothly for customers to ensure they leave your store with a smile on their face. Joining me today are BizCast panelists and former retail employees Dana and Justin who will discuss their experiences from their time in the retail world as well as experiences as frustrated customers. During the busiest time of the year, many retailers face the harsh reality that their systems are not ready for this surge in traffic. A lot of mistakes can be made such as having inaccurate inventory counts to sending out the wrong products to the customers. Today we're going to talk about efficiency for the holiday season by going over common mistakes that retailers make, not only during said holiday season, but throughout the year in general. These mistakes happen quite a bit due to a lack of preparation and we're going to talk about what you can do to prevent these mistakes from happening and we're going to discuss how you can fix the mistake and be ready to turn that customer's frown into a smile. Remember, just because your store has made a mistake that has created an angry customer doesn't mean it's too late to convert said angry customer to a happy one. We're going to cover some mistakes, go over a few examples, and help you keep your store on track, running efficiently, and ensuring that every customer that you serve leaves with a smile on face and even better ready to recommend your store to all their friends. Everybody is out doing their Christmas shopping right now and if you're in the retail business this is an episode that you certainly do not want to skip over and you certainly do not want to skip through this episode. You'll want to listen to everything that we discuss as we help you prepare yourself for a surge in customers. The first mistake I want to discuss is is when you have inaccurate inventory. During this time of the year there's going to be a lot of customers who are rushing out to the store seeking the perfect gifts for their loved ones. This can be very overwhelming. It's overwhelming for both the customer and the store. So let's say you looked online, you saw the product that you wanted to buy, and the website said it was in stock. It said it had several in stock, only to find out when you come into the store to buy it, or worse, you bought it online and reserved it for pickup at the store. They inform you that it's out of stock and you went all the way down there for nothing and now you have to get refunded. That can be quite angering. That can leave a bad taste in the customer's mouth. And Justin, you've worked at Walmart. You've told me that you have seen firsthand this mistake being made there. Please tell me what happened. What did you see that was causing their inventory to be inaccurate? They were ordering stuff faster than it could be stocked on the uh, sales floor. 
floor in the department I was working at at the time, which was overnights in the refrigerated and frozen department. And because of inaccurate ordering, they really didn't know what they had on hand, especially on the sales floor. This has since been corrected while I was working there. But at the time, this would have been back in 2007 was the last year I worked there, which is before online ordering really gained a foothold in the retail industry. One of the problems I was always running into is that they were ordering more than what us stockers could actually physically place on the shelf on the sales floor from the stock room to keep up with on a scale and crew because we couldn't get any applicants to apply for jobs to help us out with the store. And so making sure not to overload your stalker crew with stuff that they really have nowhere to put because they simply do not have enough time to actually get it on the sales floor within their allotted shift is one thing that you can do to keep accurate inventory is to not order more than what the store can physically hold at the location in the stock room and sales floor combined. And to also keep Keep your shrink, which is an industry term in retail for theft or other things of that nature, such as product that expires on the sales floor to a minimum. And that was a big problem at that particular Walmart I was working for at the time. And Additionally, keeping a full crew of stalkers, especially if you're a location that's open 24 hours a day, not all businesses are like that anymore, but for those that are, making sure that you've got an adequately staffed third shift for stocking, which is typically not going to be as busy as your typical 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. shifts. The third shift, which is typically in the retail industry, 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. is the shift you want to pay the most attention to for stocking staff because that can often be the hardest one to hire for. That's one thing that I've noticed in my workplace career is that especially in retail, if you want to just stock things on the sales floor and they're a 24-hour store, you're more likely to get hired if you apply for the night shift. Yes, that's true. A lot of people do not like working at night, so chances are there's going to be some openings for some night crew positions available, and especially during this time of the year. But when it comes to keeping an accurate inventory count, you're right, Justin, that it is important to make sure that you're not overdoing it when it comes to ordering your inventory. You don't want to order more than what your store can handle. So if the sales floor and the stock room are both exceeding capacity, you're going to see a lot more more than what you can actually handle. So let me ask you this. What happened in this case when both the stock room and the sales floor ended up exceeding capacity for what they could hold? You know, the sales floor wasn't usually a problem because it was a college town where it was located within about a half hour drive of about six or eight different colleges. The sales floor was almost always empty. Even at night, the cashiers were lines were usually averaging 36 people deep. And that's one of the reasons that store ended up having to keep their self scans open 24 hours a day. That store ended up only ever closing on Christmas because of it, because they simply couldn't handle the capacity that was moving through that store because of how many people would go in there on any shift. My personal experience was that if I was going to buy something in that store, do it after I clock out at the end of my shift because it would take at least 45 minutes once I got a place in line to actually check out even at the self-scans. And in addition to having excess inventory like you mentioned here, what about what I initially mentioned when when the inventory simply does not reflect what y'all actually have in stock? So let's say they had a certain number of units of of such and such product, but when the customer came in to buy the product, y'all didn't have any units in stock. Have y'all experienced that problem where they wanted to buy something that they believed was in stock because they either saw it on the Walmart website or heard from another source it was in stock only to be disappointed when they came to the store to see that y'all didn't have it? It was something that was interesting because about half the stock when I started there that was in the freezer section, sometimes there'd be entire pallets of stuff in the back room that had actually accidentally expired because it hadn't been able to get stocked in time, even though the customers wanted the merchandise. And the website would say it was there, but half the time when they'd come in, especially in my department, ask them for what it was, I'd have to tell them, we don't even carry that. We haven't been able to order that in. Oh gosh, it's been, and I'd have to give them a figure often in the upper or single digit years for how long that store had been unable to even get that product from the warehouse, never mind 
having it in the back room. Your store, in addition to hiring more help, your store also needed a severe audit of what y'all really had back there. That's why there were so many inaccuracies between the inventory and what was being shown on the website. So people were coming in, they wanted these products. Y'all presumably believe y'all didn't have it in stock or just didn't know it was in the warehouse, right? It sounds like that they needed to strictly audit the back rooms, the inventory more to see what was truly back there. It sounds like that they were slacking when it came to doing counts. That's what it sounds like to me. They were not doing a thorough audit to see what was really back there. And as a result, the store took losses because a lot of those perishable items ended up expiring and thus had to be discarded. Oh yeah, that was a big problem in that store. And it's common across a lot of retailers that there'll be expired merchandise in the stock room that somehow makes it onto the sales floor. And sometimes people do not always check the expiration dates before they buy the product, which is something that I think more consumers should do. And if you do notice an expired product on the shelf, please make sure that the associate knows about it so that the store can get it taken care of. That's actually been a problem at some of the local stores out here where we've actually notified asset protection in the store of expired merchandise on the sales floor shelf that they've needed to take care of because one of the things that people may not realize is that you can actually get a store potentially in trouble if they sell expired merchandise without clearance to do so from the government. Potentially, you can actually get companies in a lot of trouble for selling expired merchandise if they don't have special secondhand clearances to do stuff like that for certain types of items that are legal to do that with. I wouldn't know the full details, but you'd have to do your own research to find out what your local laws about that are in the jurisdiction of those of you who are listening to this. That is incredibly insane that stores would do this. Now, it is possible that due to the lack of attention by employees who are stocking the shelves, they may be putting expired products out just because they aren't realizing that they're already past their sell-by dates. They're just taking pallets of merchandise. They're putting it out there without paying any attention to what that expiration date is. So my solution to this would be have a very, very strict attention to detail to what's in the back room and what you're putting out on the shelf, especially if it's a perishable item. Have a very strict sense of attention. Pay very strict attention to what you're doing. And one way you can do this is to have a specialized inventory platform that will allow you to log everything digitally. I'm pretty sure Walmart has this being that they're a large corporation, but many small businesses do not utilize these types of software platforms due to how much they cost. But if you have a software platform that will allow you to log every single item that you're putting on the shelf by different attributes, such as category, pricing, expiration date, if it's a perishable item, the date it was obtained, that will really help you keep things organized a lot better. I used to work at a company a long time ago, a promotional products company, where anytime we got inventory of certain items that we were working with, we had to scan it into the computer system. And then the computer system would log the box and how many units were in each box. That way we would have a general idea of what was in stock should anybody from the customer service department ask us how many we had because a customer might be calling in wondering about that themselves. Yeah, sometimes there were inaccuracies, but when there were, we would always make sure that everything was made accurate. So it's important to make sure that you have a special system of logging your inventory and know the ins and outs of each product that you're putting on the shelf. That will help destroy this pitfall and business owners can avoid the mistake of having inaccurate inventory and running out of stock. For those of you who listen to some of the other episodes of BizCast, our good friend Sarah Russell was telling us a story about how she ordered some products online when she was doing her Christmas shopping and she drove several miles into town to go pick up these items and when she got there the employee informed her that they didn't have any of the items in stock that she bought even though the website said they were available. It was discovered that they had done some major overhauls to their inventory systems and therefore the website inventory was not syncing up with the in-store inventory system as they had not been integrated yet so this was creating a lot of trouble for everybody who was shopping there and she even told me that she was so upset that she just didn't buy anything from them anymore. It was very hectic and you know she was very upset and disappointed that she drove all the way out there for absolutely nothing. The employees weren't even aware until that very moment that their website inventory 
inventory was not reflecting what was actually in the store itself. The next mistake that I want to discuss is the mistake of sending the wrong item. This is a very common mistake that retailers make simply because during this time of the year, there's a lot of hustle and bustle going on. The employees themselves feel like they're overworked. There is probably a good chance that because the employees have so much going on and they have so much to handle that they're not paying attention to what they are putting out for shipment when they're getting the products from the warehouse. They're not paying any attention to what they are packing up and getting ready to be shipped to the customer. This is an ongoing problem, especially if stores are not staffed. This is similar to what you were just telling me about, Justin, when it came to not having enough help in the stock room. Well, not having enough help can also lead to inaccurate orders because a select number of employees can only handle so much. They are probably getting burned out. They're not paying attention to what they are packing and getting ready to get shipped. And as a result, the customer is getting the wrong items. They may have grabbed an item that was similar to what they ordered, but it wasn't the exact one they ordered. Let's say somebody buys a green shirt, but the poor overworked employee in the warehouse accidentally sends over a red shirt because maybe on the order slip, they overlooked that one detail that it was supposed to be green. Same product, but different color. The customer is probably not going to be happy because it's not the color that they requested. So this is going to end up resulting in the customer calling customer service to get this issue rectified. Now this can be costly for the company too, especially if they have to pay the return shipping for the customer to have them send the wrong item back. Sending the wrong item is a mistake that can easily be avoided when your staff is paying attention. Now, Dana, you told me that you had a story to share about having the wrong item sent to you after you made an online purchase. Please tell us more about what happened. All right. Hey, Christian. So there's a couple of situations about this. The most recent one was very, very recently. It was actually like last week. I had ordered a friend of mine a pair of slippers, house slippers, and they were supposed to be like a beautiful moonlight blue swords. And they were really, really pretty online. And this gorgeous like guy light blue. And I, we were really looking forward to them. And what we get, it was Amazon. And with the holiday season, as you mentioned, you know, people can overlook the specific details. But what was going on was we ended up getting a gray pair, the same slippers gray. And unfortunately, my friend does not like gray. So what ended up happening, fortunately, I just processed a refund and went to a the nearby Staples to return it. Went back onto my card. However, it was very frustrating because, well, my friend needed new slippers and she was looking forward to blue ones. They got gray ones, which is really not her color at all. And it was upsetting. Additionally, there was another time, I think it was last year for Christmas time, I had ordered a t-shirt and the company, it was Kohl's. I ordered from Kohl's online and they send three of the same t-shirts, just different sizes and colors. Well, they ended up sending two of the correct ones and then one of them is totally wrong. They had um, sent a t-shirt instead of it being the harry potter you know triple wand together i think it was together till the end t-shirts the three of them they sent two of the same you know to what i ordered but then the third one it literally says beer runs on my cardio and it's like we don't even drink so it's just completely the wrong one i called customer service on that and they said so we'll replace the order for that one particular item no problem free of charge it's just frustrating so i said so what do you want me to do with the other shirt and said well you can't return it unfortunately because you didn't order it can't return it so i was like i'll just probably donate it at this point it's just become our i don't care if it gets dirty because i'm using it for cleaning t-shirts so it was just really upsetting that instead of the t-shirt we wanted which was the harry potter trio wand t-shirt together to the end i think it said we got beer runs are my cardio we don't even drink that was really really frustrating on that it was embarrassing too almost your example provides a great insight as to why it's important to make sure that retailers send out the correct items when they are packing up all of the items to be shipped out to the customers. Returns are sadly an unavoidable part of conducting a retail business and they cost companies an average of 4.4% of their revenue. It's important to remember that if you're a small business owner, you probably do not have access to a special retail management system due to them being quite costly. Large corporations like Kohl's and Walmart have these systems in place, but for 
small business owners? Probably not. If you're selling online and you're using WooCommerce, there are plugins available that will turn the back end of your website into a retail management system that will help you manage your inventory better. You can generate packing slips to show what each order is supposed to contain, including all of the specifics about the items, such as the colors and the sizes. If you are packing up all the orders, getting them ready to be shipped out, or you have a team that does this, utilize a retail management system in some way. Utilize it and make sure that everybody is paying as close attention as humanly possible to all the specs of the order. That way you can catch the mistake before they get shipped out to the customer. You don't want the customer to catch your own mistake. You, the business owner, and your employee should catch the mistake before the package even leaves your warehouse or your storefront. Catch the mistake by paying very close attention. The hustle and bustle of the holiday season should not impede on your ability to do your job properly. Even though there's a lot of rush, it's still important to have a focused mindset and make sure that everything is taken care of ahead of time, that you know very well that what you are packing up is the exact same thing as what's written on the order details. A good retail management system will generate order slips and give detailed reports of exactly what is to be shipped, which item, what variations of the item are to be shipped out, and where it's supposed to go. Please make sure that the tags on the item match the product. The problem with the slippers is that there was a tag on top of the tag that said the gray on it and the, the label that was scanned, I have reason to believe was slapped on top of the gray slippers tag. So the blue slippers tag was on top of the gray slippers tag. So they scanned the blue slippers tag and they didn't even bother to double check. That was really upsetting. Yeah, I understand exactly what you mean. There are many customers just like you out there who are upset because of the lack of attention to detail that some employee over at the warehouse made. For small businesses, they cannot afford to lose out on revenue due to mistakes like this. So the whole purpose of us doing this episode is to really stress the importance of paying attention so that stuff like that does not happen in the small business world. Large corporations can afford to take on some revenue losses, but small business owners cannot. Small business owners have families to feed. A lot of them are solopreneurships where it's only one person running the show, maybe another person, and they may or may not have a small team of employees, but small business owners should not be making these mistakes because you want your customer base to continue returning to you. If you're dropping the ball every time on customer service and customer satisfaction, and especially for mistakes that are avoidable like these, you are at risk of possibly having your reputation damaged, especially if it's more than one customer that's upset. In general, it's important to have a clear view of your value chain. Always make sure you know the ins and outs of what's being shipped. And I have another example to share. This one also comes from our friend, Sarah Russell. She told me that she ordered some athletic wear online through a website, but when she received her package, she got something completely different than what she ordered. So she called in, told them what happened, and here's the messed up part about the whole thing. They told her that she could ship the items back, but she still had to pay for shipping. She discussed this in a previous episode, and I think it was just messed up that she had to take a loss on her purchase like that because they told her that she would have to pay the shipping costs to send it back, especially since it wasn't even her fault. She ordered the right thing. They sent her the wrong thing, and that is... an easy way to kill the experience for the customer. It's one thing to make a mistake and dissatisfy the customer over a wrong item, but if your company's mistake causes the customer to have to pay even more than what they've already paid to begin with, you think that customer's going to come back and shop with you again? Probably not. It's important to make sure that you send out the right product the first time, check all the ins and outs of everything you're sending, utilize a retail management system. Like I said, if you have a website built with WooCommerce, which is what we use here at CDG to build e-commerce websites. WooCommerce has a lot of plugins that can help you transform the back end of your website into a very efficient platform that will help you manage orders as they're coming in. You can look at each detail of each order and you can also manage returns and generate packing slips easily. Now we're going to talk more about returns later. The next mistake I want to talk about is when you have an inefficient checkout process. So what does this mean you may ask? This means that you have a checkout process that is full, that is ridiculously complicated, or it is just not set up to where you can handle customers easily, meaning that you're seeing long lines, customers are having trouble paying. There's just all sorts of faults with your checkout process, and the customer is not able to simply purchase an item and be out the door within a certain amount of time. Now, if you see long 
lines at the stores, that alone is a red flag that they are not putting in enough effort to make sure that checkout processes are more streamlined. Maybe there's a lack of cashiers working or something along those lines. If your store is transitioning to self-checkout, maybe a lot of the machines are down. If you see that there are lots of long lines at your store, that's a sign that you need to step in and do something. I'm going to talk about brick and mortar checkout and I'm going to talk about e-commerce checkout. Let's discuss brick and mortar checkout first. Let's say you go to the store. Maybe you only have a few items to buy. You're not buying a full cart full of things. So in your mind, you're thinking you'll be in and out of the door in just a few minutes, right? But when you get up to the front of the store where all the checkout lanes are, you see lines that are stretching all the way to who knows how far. I mean, I've seen lines stretch all the way to the back of the store before in some cases. As soon as I see that, the first thing I do is I put my purchases down. I don't buy anything and I walk out the door, especially if I'm on a time crunch. I'm not going to wait in that long line, especially if it's just for a few trivial items. I'll just put them down and I'll go somewhere else. Now, if you own a storefront, do not let this be the case. Do not allow inefficient checkout processes to be the reason why you're losing out in sales, especially during this time of the year. You'll want to make sure that you invest in self-checkout. Now, I know that's easier said than done, especially for startups and small businesses on a budget, but self-checkout stations can certainly save you a lot of time and money. For one thing, you don't have to hire any cashiers to check people out. The self-checkout just lets the customer do it for them. However, there may be times where customers don't want to use self-checkout for a variety of reasons. For example, maybe they have too many items and they don't feel like going to the hassle of having to scan and bag all their items. Then, in this case, if you know that that might be a problem at your store, consider hiring more cashiers. Now, I do see a lack of cashiers at certain big box retailers. I've noticed that out of all the lanes they have open, only two out of 10 lanes are open. And I am also aware of the fact that stores like Walmart are focused more on self-checkout. They have converted a lot of their checkout lanes to self-checkout lanes where the customers just simply load their items on the conveyor belt, but then they have to scan and bag all their stuff themselves. It's important to make sure that you have an equal balance of self-checkout lanes and cashiers, especially since there are people who actually want to work. People are looking for jobs and they'll be completely content being a cashier. Don't let self checkouts kill job opportunities for people who are willing to work. But at the same time, keep your customers in mind as well. There are customers who are fine with self-checkout and then your less tech savvy customers or your customers who just don't feel like scanning items, keep them in mind by having a good number of cashiers available. Always make sure that you have a good checkout process set up. Make sure that customers are able to get their purchases scanned and that they're out the door and ready to move on with the rest of their day. Do not make them wait in long lines simply because because you don't have enough self-checkout stations or you don't have enough cashiers on hand, make sure that that is not a problem. If you hire the cashiers that you need to keep your store going, and if you have enough self-checkout stations, guess what? You're not going to see long lines at a few particular checkout lanes because they're the only ones open. Make sure you have several lanes open, they're staffed, you have efficient cashiers, and they're getting items scanned out. Now I want to talk about the e-commerce side of things. To make things easier for those customers who like to make purchases online, make sure for one thing that you have guest checkout available because maybe somebody wants to buy something but they do not feel like going through the extra steps of having to create an account with your store that they have to leave your website to go verify their email verify their account add all of their billing information to their account you know it just adds extra steps and it prolongs the checkout process there are people who do not want to make an account on your website they just want to make their purchase and be on their way enable guest checkout to make sure that who do not desire to go through those extra steps of making an account on your website can purchase their items and move on. Do not force them to make an account. Now, making an account has benefits because this will allow them to keep a record of all their purchases, have their card information stored, so that way they don't have to keep typing it in every time they make a purchase. But for those who are not interested in that or they just don't care, they just want to buy and move on, make sure guest checkout is available. And always make sure that you accept all commonly used credit cards and debit cards like Visa, MasterCard, Discover, American Express. Never limit your options when it comes to payment. If you want to accept PayPal, if you want to accept any other third-party payment processing platform, that will also help make sure that customers are able to complete their checkout process easier because maybe they don't feel comfortable typing their credit card information directly into the website and they'd rather have a third-party payment processor like PayPal handle it. Maybe they just find PayPal easier to use. Always make sure that your process 
is streamlined. Make sure that all costs are up front, such as taxes and shipping costs. And if you offer gift cards, make sure the gift card section of your checkout process is fully functional. If you're getting a new website built, there are ways to test to make sure that everything works properly. You can always do a dry run on your websites before you launch them live to the public using a sample product, or if you're using PayPal, you use sandbox mode. Always make sure that you have an SSL certificate on your website. This just means that all the data that's being transmitted through your website, especially these sensitive credit card numbers and home addresses, are safe. They're transmitted securely. If you're using any website at all, maybe not just for buying stuff, but just in general, look up in the address bar and make sure that that green padlock is there or it says secure. Depends on what browser you're using, but there's always going to be a padlock next to the address bar. Ensuring that customers have an easy way to check out and giving them the confidence that their purchases are secure will help streamline the online checkout process easier. And it's always important to make sure that you keep things streamlined as much as possible. Before I give my example, Dana, Justin, do y'all have anything you want to say? Do y'all have any horror stories? I have a horror story from working at Kohl's back in the day. Yes, please share. So, oh gosh, this was was about five or six years ago and probably also ties with will tie into your next point as well you mentioned you're going to do returns here in a bit too correct yes so this kind of ties into both so i was actually working the customer service desk at that time of my employment and as i said this is about five or six years ago so i was working customer service and there was the cashier on the men's side registers which is where in the store that i was working at the time and i was the only one working at customer service and there was only one cashier on the men's side registers. I don't even know what was on the missus side because quite frankly, from the vantage point I was at, I couldn't see anything over there. There was a department literally in the middle of my view. So I really, and it didn't really matter to me at the time either. However, one cashier and one customer service associate, and I have seen reviews for that particular location about this incident. And I think I brought it up to you as well, Christian, about one of the reviews I had found on this. And this one reviewer said that she had gone in to see, and I actually remember this incident too, very, very well. She had gone in, I know the family very well, very sweet. She had gone into her shopping for the son, the shoes that were a tad bit too large for him, and wanted to look for a jacket for the daughter. But there were just lines that were halfway across the store, around the corner, all the way to the back of the men's side registers, which is also where the shoe department is on that side of the store. So she's like, I'm not going to bother with trying to find a pair of shoes for my son when he can just grow into them. And with respect to the girl's jackets for her daughters, they were all the ones that were there were just stuff that the daughter did not like. And then she's like, well, I'm just trying to find socks and there was no signs. Everything was all over the place. Remember, this was this early December holiday season. And I was the only one working customer service. And there was, oh gosh, at that point, there were probably like 10, 15 people in line, individual customers customer parties. You're probably talking like 10 or 15 individual parties in line. Nobody could help me out. Nobody was helping the poor cashier out either. And it's just everybody was standing there or in their respective lines for like 10 minutes before they'd even be seen if they were at the first in line, let alone forget about the last in the line. It's just, why? Why? Around the holiday season, you'd think corporations would have more cashiers on hand or even people who can help out and back up cashiers. You know, more people on the sales floor more cashiers. Heck, even if it's temporary jobs, seasonal jobs, you know, things like that. I actually started with Kohl's as a temporary position when they were remodeling the store. They needed extra hands. Fortunately, I was able to be kept. I understand not everybody was, but it's just hire more people who can do, you know, the work. I understand if they have disability like dyslexia, you won't be able to work on the cashiering. But if you can restock the floor with dyslexia, I don't see why not. One of my coworkers from Hillsborough Kohl's, had dyslexia. She was not able to do the cashier, but who she was really good at the intermittent accessories department. She was our go-to for that. Regardless, make sure you have these people who are able to be cashiers, who are able to do stocking on the floor and organizing the floor too. And please, please retailers, please corporations, please small businesses, do not put your employees in a position where I was. One day, I didn't even get a break and I had worked a seven and a 
half hour day. And I didn't even get a chance to have lunch. And I know that's a mandated break. You have to take your half hour. I didn't even get a chance to do that. I was that swamped. Please do not put your employees in a predicament that I had to deal with numerous times. I've been working retail since 2011. I know I mentioned this on other podcasts, Christian, and I'm still trying to find work. I'm still trying to find work and everybody's hiring. But and if you're just going to go away from cashiers, what's the point? Exactly. I don't encourage retailers to go away from cashiers. Like I said earlier, they need to keep a good balance between self-checkout and actual cashier checkout lanes. There needs to be a balance between the two because like I said, some people are completely fine with self-checkout and others don't want to touch the self-checkouts. They won't touch them with a 10-foot pole. And some people are afraid of self-checkout because if you miss one item, you could easily rack up a shoplifting charge thinking you may have paid for it. And the law doesn't care if you intended to pay for it or not. Once you take it past point of sale, it's stealing. And that's just a fear that some people have that because they don't know how to use the self-checkout machine very well, they may forget to scan an item when they thought they've scanned it. And then next thing you know, loss prevention is getting ready to prosecute them. But you know, that's another discussion for another time. But my point being is that stores need to keep the door for career opportunities open by offering more jobs, especially during the holiday season. There's a lot of people buying Christmas gifts. They need the help. They do need more cashiers at these stores. And what you went through, Dana, is just unacceptable. In fact, what you told me reminds me of what I witnessed a few years ago at my neighborhood Dairy Queen. Now, this was a long time ago. And of course, this is fast food, not retail. But the same thing applies. I remember I went in there and all I wanted was a sundae. You know, nothing else. I just wanted a dessert. But the guy they had running the front counter. Guess what? They also had him running the drive through window too. I saw this poor guy running back and forth between the drive through and the front counter. And in my mind, I'm thinking they're just overworking this poor guy. They're probably not paying him extra for it. I'm pretty sure they aren't. They're just making him run back and forth, back and forth, stressing out, trying to kill two birds with one stone and it's not working. And that's what your story reminds me of. It was just a really sad sight to see that they were overworking this poor guy, but he's probably being severely under paid. Yeah, no, that's quite unfortunate. And I hope that that location, that's that company has turned it around. That actually reminds me of what Justin said before a while ago about him working at Wendy's. I know, again, you're talking fast food, not retail, but overworking the individual. Justin, how many people was that when you left? When I left, in order to replace and keep the place up to cope with the workload that I'd been putting in, they had to hire 20 to 30 people to cover the workload that I left behind. Yeah, that is incredible. Working. That's just plain incredible to hear that. I mean, 30 people working at a fast food restaurant, most fast food restaurants don't even hire that many people to begin with because unlike retail, they don't need as many people. But at the Dairy Queen that I'm talking about in question, I didn't see many people working there. There was just one guy running the counter and the drive through window and then somebody else in the back cooking the food. Those are the only two employees I saw there. And I should also mention that this was back in 2019 before the pandemic even happened. It seems like that they were already suffering from a lack of employees. And in any business, whether it's retail, fast food, or any type of business in general, it's always important to make sure that you have a decent amount of employees to cover all areas. Small business owners, especially startups who are solopreneurs, sadly, they have to wear all the hats and do everything at once. And if you're in that position, just make sure that you are good at multitasking. Make sure that you have this octopus mindset that I always talk about, meaning that you know how to handle a million different things at once and you never let one overshadow the other and that you're able to keep your focus on each one without any problems. But when it comes to retail efficiency, it's always important to make sure that you have enough employees to handle every customer coming in. The other example that I wanted to share where I've seen a lack of efficiency and this didn't have to do with the holidays, but year round is how they have things set up at Cracker Barrel restaurants. When you walk in, they have a gift shop and it's full of a bunch of little trinkets and country themed items. And you have to go through the gift shop to get to the restaurant. Once you go through the gift shop area, there is a large dining room. You go into the dining room, you order your food. When you're ready to pay, you would think that they would give you your check. Your server would take your debit card, run your card, then bring it back, right? Not at Cracker Barrel. What they do is 
is they give you your check on a receipt. Then you have to get in line at the gift shop to pay for your meals. This results in really long lines, including people who are shopping at the gift shops. You can see where I'm going with this, right? They are commingling diners with gift shop patrons. And as a result, the lines are getting really long because there's only two cashiers, I believe, and one counter with two separate register systems. They have to take all these people and the lines are long and there's people who want to hurry and get out. And it's a very cramped space too. So that doesn't help matters. People don't want to be cramped in that little gift shop just so they could pay their bill and move on. What they should be doing is they should have a separate point of sale system in the kitchen area for servers to process dining customers. So that way the gift shop counter can be reserved all for people purchasing items there. There's no reason for them to commingle. This is completely opposite of being efficient. This is just creating congestion at the front of the restaurant. And a lot of people who go there, they're not interested in the gift shop. They just want to eat and leave. Having to put them in line with people who want to pay for gift shop items is just creating headaches. What do y'all think about that? I think that's just stupid. Honestly, if I had to be blunt about that, I think that's just stupid. I think that they could have thought of a much, much better way of doing that. And just utilizing the gift shop for both purposes. It, yeah, that's stupid. That's chaotic. And that's probably one of the reasons I've never even, you know, eaten there. Honestly, I don't know. But that actually makes me not want to eat there now and try it because of the inefficiency and just your sheer chaoticness and stupidity that that might cause. I don't want to have to wait 45 so minutes just to pay for my meal when I could have been all the way out of there and all the way home and doing other things at that time, whatever. That's stupid, in my opinion. What do you think, Justin? You agree? I agree. That's really dumb. And that reminds me that Walmart I was working for, because unfortunately, being the only retailer I could walk to at the time, since when I worked there, I did not have a driver's license. So I had to do the majority of my shopping there. So when I was working there, I always had to budget at least 45 minutes for time to stand in line to just wait to be checked out, even if I was at self-scan. Oh, please. That was Target the other day, if you remember. I had gone getting groceries and we had to wait like 20, 30 minutes just for the cashier. The poor guy was by himself and they changed self-scan to only have 10 items or less. And if we had a cart full of items, we could have been in and out of the self-scan in no time because of how much we've used it at Target. And yet I, we couldn't use self-scan because we had like 12 or you know 20 or so items. So they wouldn't let us there. But it's just unfortunate because that poor guy guy, when we finally got up to the cashier, I'm like, I am so sorry you have to deal with this. They really should put more cashiers on. And I think they were trying to get somebody else to help out because we had frozen stuff. We had time temperature sensitive items and we're standing there 30, 35 minutes in the line just to pay for our frozen stuff to get it home in the freezer. By that point, it was almost thought out. That's just why. So yeah, Cracker Barrel, you can do better. You can do so much better than that. And I think that self-scan so especially if you're going to sell items that are age restricted, don't go with self-scan because you're going to have to check the ID with a human anyway. And that's going to delay things if they have to wait 10, 15 minutes for somebody to come over and verify their ID to the computer. Oh, how about the, if you're a drugstore and you have self-scan and customer's insurance has an over-the-counter benefits card sent to you, like mine did, and you can't even use your OTC benefits card on at self-scan. You have to use it at a register. So there, now you got to wait 10 for somebody else to come by anyways. What's the point? I hotly agree with everything you guys have said. All the brands that we've mentioned, all the companies we've mentioned, they can all do better. We're pointing out exactly what their mistakes are and how the small business community can learn from them so that they don't make these mistakes as well. That's just not right. Have you guys noticed that we've only covered the first three mistakes, but there's one common denominator between all three of them? And do you see what it is? Do you see what it is, Justin? The hiring process, I'm guessing? Understaffed. Hiring process and the amount of staff on hand or lack thereof. Yes, that's right. The first three mistakes all involve the lack of staff. It's either that companies are not hiring or they are so focused on trying to rely on AI to control everything that they're not hiring people. But it's not mm -hmm. only that though. Maybe they're hiring, but people do not want to work anymore. Ever since the pandemic, people have gotten lazy. There's a lot of people who just do not want to go to work anymore. And this is especially true for the younger generations. It seems like 
like that. Christian, I'm actually going to correct you on that. Being I am without work still, and I hope you don't mind me saying so, being I am without work, I can tell you right now, $15 an hour is what our minimum wage in New Jersey is going to be next year. I'm going to tell you right now, even $20 an hour full time is not livable in New Jersey. So I'm going to venture to bet that a lot of these younger generations might, you know, the individuals might not want to be working because they won't be able to afford living at the cost. I think this has something to do with the financial crisis dating back to 2008, if you remember that. That, I believe, kickstarted everything going haywire. And I have reason to believe that might be, I don't know, 100%, but still, and it's like, I've seen a lot of these, you know, Gen Z individuals saying, I went to school, got my degree, and now I can't even work. I was making more money doing my part-time gig before I went to school than I am in a field right after college. So I don't think it's necessarily laziness that could be part of it, but I think it could also be that they're not paying a livable wage. That is also frustrating. Uh, Justin, you had told me at one point about a CEO that actually cut his paycheck to meet everybody else, correct? Correct. I remember uh, this was a credit card processing company I heard about online a couple of years ago where uh, the CEO got together with the board of directors and decided that everybody at that company would make exactly the same amount annually and that it would not matter if you were the CEO or all the way down to the janitor. Nobody would make more money than anyone else in the company. Including the CEO would make the exact same. He actually willingly took a pay cut to make this happen because he knew just how the people were struggling this. So I'm going to say I don't think it's necessarily laziness per se. That might be part of it, but I think a lot of it is just we cannot afford to live. We cannot afford to live. We cannot afford to pay our bills and get groceries, pay our bills, you know, and everything and still have a safety net. We can't afford it. I'm still without a job. I'm 98 job applications deep since January and I can't even afford to live. So how can everybody else in Gen Z? I don't think laziness is the whole part of this, Christian. I'm going to just completely correct you right there. And I think that there's a limit to how much time you can actually spend in a workplace, not just from a legal side, but from a physical stamina side of things. You have to sleep sometime and it seems like some people People are working two or three full times jobs just to stay afloat. And the last numbers I saw, the savings rate in this country has actually gone into the negatives, which means that people are spending more than they're making. Because they can't afford to live. Because the cost of living has just gotten way too high. My one bedroom, one bathroom apartment, 749 square foot apartment in New Jersey, North Plainfield, New Jersey, is costing over two grand a month. It's insane. I'm fortunate I have my parents, but I actually see what the rent is every month because it's not just rent, it's also water and sewer. And my parents are paying upwards of $2,500 for water and sewer and rent with only like not even $30 of that as water and sewer. So we can't even afford to live, period. How do they expect people to work if they know that they can't even afford to live, period? You know what I'm saying, Christian? I do. Yes, I understand exactly what you mean. The jobs are just very unattractive. And see, right now, stores are looking for employees. If they're not looking, they were looking back in October or even September when they were getting ready to hire for the season. But I can see why a lot of people are turned off from these jobs. And it's also the main reason why a lot of people are just choosing to start their own business. But that's another topic for another episode. I want to go over the next mistake that retailers are making, and that is having poor handling of returns. Retailers often drop the ball when it comes to returns because they don't have a simple process. Sometimes they might have a process that's extremely frustrating. And Dana, I'm going to have you share an example in just a minute. But what I mean by that is, let's say you bought something from a store that operates both online and at physical stores. When you decide that you want to return the item that you purchased, you go to one of their physical stores to return it instead of shipping it back just to help save some time and money. But when you get to the store and you get in line at the customer service desk, they call you up, you explain to them that you want to return an item that you purchased online, and then they give you this extremely long, lengthy, complicated procedure that you have to go through just to return the item. They won't just take the item from you, scan it back, put it back in their inventory, and give you a refund. You have to jump through so many hoops just to get this taken care of. At most stores, this is not a problem, but there may be one oddball store out there that suffers from this 
problem. And as a result, it is going to be a turnoff for a lot of customers. As they get angry, they're going to leave reviews online. They're going to tell their friends and family not to shop at your store. After they explain to them what they went through just to return one item, do not have an extremely lengthy return policy. Make sure they're able to return their item, get refunded or do an exchange and be out the door in a timely manner. Don't tell them they have to do this, do that, do this, do that, just so they can get their money back or swap the item out for something else. Make it easy for them. And Dana, you've also told me that you have a story to share related to poor returns. Please share it with us. Well, it's not necessarily the return process. It's more of the efficiency or lack thereof sometimes around the holiday season. When I was working at Kohl's, and this was when I was still working in Hillsborough, New Jersey, we at customer service would, you know, around the holiday season. And this was actually after Christmas. So once all that post-holiday returns were becoming in, we'd have the returns and then we'd have the return center. So with the returns at customer service, the return center would be taking everything and processing it. And sometimes I'd actually be working return center due to how I was, you know, so quick and efficient with customer service, I would be helping out back there in the return center. So the difference, customer service would process the returns and we'd have to keep them organized and everything. We were not allowed to put it back behind customer service because of the surplus of returns and how many were coming in a day. They had a separate area in the stock room, which in this location was already halfway across the store as it is going from the stock room with literally laundry bins, those big, big hospitality grade laundry bins to come to customer service, collect all of the returns. And they were even stopping at the registers and getting all those too. Well, it sounds great, but when you have people who don't know what they're doing back there, that's when things can get all haywire. So for the lack of efficiency side of things, you had people who really did not know how to scan things back in, how to organize things back there even. It's like we had, you know, for example, children's department was infants and toddlers. And then they also had the boys and girls kids section. And then you'd have to separate the two as well because that's how they want it done. And there are people who don't even know how to use the clearance machine. Here's the thing for you at the Bluebirds. We had Bluebirds at that time. This was pre-Zebras. And we had these Bluebirds and nobody knew how to use them how to connect them, how to connect them to the clearance printers. And it's just, if you're going to have people working in that area of your store, please, please have them know what they're doing. Because I can tell you when I was back there working return center, when I was doing that and processing all the returns and the stock room, I was literally running the whole shift. I was doing everything. I was telling them how to do things. It's like I had to babysit them too. And that's not my job description. It's not babysitting your coworkers. Why you are trying to tell them what to do and they're not knowing what to do and they don't do anything. That's not part of my job description. Last I checked. And it's unfortunate because then once that happens, it's like nothing gets back on the shelf. Then you got, again, your angry customers because, hey, you know, this was supposed to be on the shelf, but, you know, then, okay, where is it? Well, you know, Return Center hasn't processed it. What do you mean they haven't processed it? I don't know. I got to check with them. And it's just no communication. In addition, bringing up the whole online ordering then returning to the store thing, please have have us an organized way to do this. When I had actually transferred to the Wachung, New Jersey location, I'm going to call this out because it was almost like a fire hazard. I think they've since corrected this, but when I was working there, at least, it was all over the place in the back. You had to go through a separate door to go around and into customer service through another door that kind of was shared with the cash office back there. Okay, no problem. Except when everything is piled in there and you can't even get out of your customer service area, let alone the back door there. Get him get out of there. I had to crawl over everything just to get out so I can clock out at the end of the day. And that in itself wasn't even the holiday time. You're talking like this was, oh gosh, you're talking like October. Yeah, this was like October. So not even Halloween. And this was going on. So you need to have some sort of efficient way of doing things. And as I said, if you're going to have people in that area, please make sure they know what they're doing or at least if they kind of get the gist, they can ask questions to other people. You know what I mean? It's frustrating. It's frustrating. 
trading, if we have to babysit our coworkers because they don't know what to do, because they're not taught, they're just thrown into this. Wow, incredible. <sighs> that should have never happened. It's not your job to babysit, you're right. And first of all, what should have been done was Cole should have implemented a very comprehensive training program to all the staff members who were involved in the returns process. For one thing, make sure that all employees at the customer service desk, and of course this applies to any retail business, have employees at the customer service desk who are in charge of processing returns. Make sure that they have a clear understanding of what the return policy is so that they can expedite it and have it move along faster so the customer can be taken care of and they can move along with their day. Secondly, with the employees who are handling the return items, taking them to the stock room and separating them out, they better make sure that they know 100% how to manage the inventory because this takes us back to what we just discussed at the beginning of the episode. If they don't know how to use the system to handle these returns to get them back into the inventory or get them categorized, guess what? The inventory numbers are going to be off. There's going to be major discrepancies on the inventory count whenever someone checks the computer system. This is not good for the customer either because they're going to be expecting to buy an item that's in stock but probably isn't due to a clerical error made by one of the stock employees. So they need to know how to utilize these systems. Clearance machines were not even that difficult to use. Like once you just, you know, unlock the device, you know, like a typical Android, you unlock it. There's no passcode or anything. You unlocked it and you flick the screen up and you're right there. All you got to do is press a couple <laughs> buttons and you're there. And it's like they open the screen. They're like, I don't know what I need to do. And it's like, OK, so you just have to use the device and you scan this barcode. Does it come up with a clearance ticket? Does a clearance ticket print out? No. OK, move on. It's so simple. It's a seemingly simple process, but it's like all, and I remember all they wanted to do back there was chit chat and, you know, be on their phones and every, I'm like, this is not your job description. This is why I had to babysit. They're on their phones. They're talking to their friends, their little clicks. I'm like, excuse you. This is not your job. Do your job. You are not doing your job. I see that a lot. That's a very common occurrence at any job, really, at any establishment. It doesn't matter if it's a retail store or a restaurant. I often see a lot of employees just playing around. Well, here's the thing. That's not the time for that. You've got to get to work. If you're going to be back there in the stock room, you're not supposed to be on your phone talking to your friends or chit-chatting. You're supposed to be learning how to run the machine, how to categorize these items, and know what you're putting into the inventory system. System, so that way that the count is accurate, not playing around on your phones, on Facebook or whatever app you're using or talking to your friends, get to work. Employees who do not put a serious focus on the task at hand hurt the company, they hurt its employees, and most importantly, they hurt the customers. Exactly. And what a lot of people may or may not realize is that just like the sales floor, there are going to be security cameras in the back room. So there I are even cameras in the break room, I've noticed, and in the executive offices. There's cameras. There's cameras everywhere, except for the bathrooms, which are obvious reasons. And there's cameras in the stock room, and they can see what they're doing. They will watch you on those things. They have. There's actually been a manager. I don't remember when and what the exact scenario was. There was actually management who came in when I was in the holiday return center, and I was doing my job. And management actually come in and be like, "Hey, what are you guys doing? Are you guys on your phone?" They're like, "No, we're not." I didn't even say anything because I, I I know better than that. And I wasn't even on my phone. Like my phone was in my locker. And it's like, are you guys on your phone? They're like, no. Why? You better not be on your phone. Management knew that they were on their phones because LP, loss prevention, had told them, hey, so-and-sos are on their phones back there instead of doing what they're doing. So, note to all those people who want to work in a retail setting and they uh, want to just do their, whatever they want to do, yeah, no. They're always watching. There's cameras in the back rooms. There's cameras in the stock room. There's cameras in the break room. Please be mindful of that. I agree. And for small business owners, if they employ a certain number of employees to help them out, they should also have good surveillance over their employees as well, because having cameras or monitoring their activity will just help ensure that they are being efficient, they're getting their jobs taken care of, and they're not trying to steal from the company and other things like that. It's important to make
make sure that you know what your employees are doing all the time while they're on the clock with you. I would always say that if I were a district manager of a large retail chain, you know what I would do? I would never tell any of the store managers or anybody at the stores that are under my umbrella, under my supervision, when I'm coming. I would always make impromptu visits, impromptu unannounced visits, because if I told them when I was coming ahead of time, people are going to pretend like they're working. They're going to put these masks on. They are going to pretend to look busy. They're going to make it look like they're taking care of this. They're going to make it look like that they're doing the right thing. Almost exactly. undercover shoppers. Yeah. I've had that happen to me at a CVS. Honestly, it was an undercover shopper. It was actually one of the district or regional individuals and they were testing us. So yeah, that's a huge instance of undercover shopping like that. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't have the intention of buying. But what they're really looking out for is the process by which things are going in that store, whether it be checkout, whether it be restock, whether it be returns, doesn't matter. They want to make sure that that process is going. You don't know who's undercover at your store. You don't know who's on your district managers or whatnot, your regionals, and you don't know who's an actual shopper, an actual genuine customer. Think the undercover boss series, Christian. You don't know if that's your CEO that you're checking out. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I've seen that show before. Wonderful show wonderful series. In a way, it's almost like scam baiting too, where people call scammers and they pretend that they're a victim, but they're just doing it to try to expose a scammer. It's pretty much the same thing. I strictly believe in being undercover to check up on what's going on. Like I said, if I were the district manager, I would never let the location know that I'm coming. I would always show up unannounced so that way I can catch people in their actual cells, not their pretend cells where they pretend to look good just because they know the big guys in the house. Yeah, that's the idea behind something that the FDA does to manufacturing facilities for food called surprise inspections, which are carried out on a regular basis to restaurants and fast food chains. And factories, I believe, as well, that deal with that. That deal with that. They do random surprise inspections all the time to make sure that things are being kept up properly. I agree with that statement. As I said, you don't know who you're checking out, if it's your regular customers or if it's a CEO or if it's a district leader or somebody on the district level. You don't know. You always act like you have a visit. Because I remember we had, when I was working at Kohl's in Hillsborough, we'd have the visit scheduled. Oh, we were there until 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning when we closed at 11, just to make sure everything was spotless. Make sure that you're always working like you'd have a surprise inspection. You'd never ever know. That's right. Always make sure that you're doing your job properly. You don't know who's there. Going back to retail in general, I want to close out by saying that business owners who have retail operations, make sure that you have a good amount of staff on hand if employees are part of your operations. If you're a solopreneur, make sure that you are able to handle your customers without any hassle. You're able to manage every single aspect of every customer encounter. Make sure you know the ins and outs of what they're buying, of what they're returning, and what their needs are. That way, there's no issues later when it comes to checking them out or giving them a refund or anything along those lines. Just make sure that you know all the ins and outs of what you're dealing with. Make sure that you're able to handle each customer without hassle and you're not cutting corners when it comes to serving them. That is what will help you survive during the holidays if you're a one-person show. Always make sure that they're able to return their purchases easier. Always make sure they receive the correct item and always make sure your inventory count is beyond accurate. There should never be any discrepancies. Utilize different platforms. Learn new methods. This episode was made to help you make sure that, to help you avoid any mistakes that many retailers commonly make throughout the holiday season. The Christmas shopping season is a very busy one. It's the busiest time of the year. You certainly do not want to drop the ball right now. Think about it. If you mess up now, then throughout the rest of the year, your customer base is going to remember that. If they decide that they're not going to shop with you during the Christmas season, because you made a mistake somewhere, they're going to remember that for the rest of the year. They'll tell their friends and they're not going to patronize you anymore. It's always important to make sure that all processes are streamlined. Everything that you advertise online or on other platforms is accurate, especially the inventory. And you will have a happy customer who will gladly return to you throughout other times of the year. Do not drop the ball when it comes to running an efficient retail operation during this time of the year. It's very busy. You've got to keep all of your customers in mind. 
all of their needs, all of their wants, and there really is no margin for error allowed when it's this busy. So that's my final word on the subject. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to say? As I always like to do on your channel, if I may again, end with a final thought for business owners in general. This one would be about how we always said that one of the main mistakes, the common denominator, is understaffing. So as I said, I am now 98 job applications deep since January. A lot of times it's because, well, I don't have the diploma or the degree at the end of my name to do these specific jobs, but yet I have the skill set to prove it. So my question for business owners in general is very simple. Would you rather hire somebody with the degree or the work experience that shows what they can do on the resume? Or would you rather hire the individual? So do you want to hire the resume or do you want to hire the person? This is the question I'm going to pose to you guys. You want to hire the resume or the individual? Make your choice and make it wisely. So people like me, for instance, and others as well, who are 98 job applications deep since January, do not have to suffer. So do you want to hire the resume or do you want to hire the individual? What is going to make the job get done efficiently? The resume or the person? Exactly. If I owned a retail operation, Dana, you would be the first person I'd hire because I already know what your work ethic is like. Can Justin come too? He's one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. I'm sure you remember. Oh, yes, of course. Can he, he come too? I'd also hire him too because I know what a hard worker he is and what he had to endure working at both Walmart and Wendy's. He would deserve a position at my store if I owned one. My advice for those of you who listen to this podcast and goof off at work, don't do it on company property. Don't do it on company time. That's what your personal time at your house is for. Or outside of company time and property. Do not do it. How many times I had to babysit people in the back because all they want to do is be on their phones. Justin, you had a situation about that too with your co-workers goofing off. Yeah, my co-workers and a lot of the retailers I worked for would be goofing off on their phones on company time. So are you there to work or are you there to goof off? Uh, if you're there to goof off, save yourself a lot of time and heartache and find a job that you actually like doing. It's going to cover your bills and allow you to do what you want to do in the amount of time you want to spend outside your work hours. There's also work from home jobs. So if you don't want to actually be somewhere working, then try to see if you qualify for a work from home job. So that's my recommendation on that. If I was the manager at your Kohl's store, Dana, the first thing mm -hmm. I would have done is I would have fired everybody except you. Everybody would have been sent home <laughs> and I would have made sure they would have been unhirable. Oh, gosh, you are not no, the that manager. He, he had his head on. So he actually at Hillsborough, he actually turned a lot of it around after a, the manager merry-go-round, I guess you can say, was going on. And that team I had when I transferred it from Hillsborough, they fixed a lot of stuff that the years past managers past have unfortunately messed up, but they also refused to hire and consider one of my coworkers who knew how to run the ends and outs of the store for a manager position because he knew too much. He would have run that store. He would have done really good. Him and my former supervisor from there, one of my good friends, the two of them, they would have run that store and they would have actually run the company better. I don't agree with the Sephora because what they're doing is they're taking the jobs away from the beauty advisors. They had to reapply and no guarantee. So that also deters things. So like what Justin says, are you going to do the work? Or are you going to just do your own thing while on the job? My question as well being, are you going to hire the resume? Or are you going to hire the person? What will get the job done better? A very important question to consider, especially for businesses who are still doing seasonal staffing. It's almost Christmas already at the time of this taping, but there are probably still a few stores out there who are in the process of looking for seasonal help. Help, and that's a very important question to remember. They need to choose wisely. And for all the retail workers out there who may be listening to this, do your jobs. Don't goof off. Do the right thing. Because even if it's just a seasonal job, you never know. After Christmas is over, they might decide to make you full time. And you're not going to get hired full time if you're going to be in the stock room being stupid on TikTok all day. You've got to take your job seriously. And that's my final word on the matter. I was temporary when I started working at Kohl's because all they needed was extra hands because of the remodeling of the store. I ended up doing my job and I ended up becoming a permanent part-time associate. Not full-time work, but part-time. I was a part-timer, but I ended up becoming permanent part-time, which is what they coded me as. 
So that's how you know that just because you got a seasonal job doesn't always mean it's going to stay seasonal. You do your job and you'd be surprised how much growth can actually happen. One of my manager, former managers from Kyle Hebron Hillsborough started as a shoe associate. She started in shoes, went up to cashiering, went up to front end supervisor and became a customer service area supervisor. So you don't know what's going to happen. You can actually get promoted from within. Happens a lot more than people realize. Quite often, a lot of companies I've found will prefer to promote from within. I mean, that may not have been an option for some of the companies I've worked for. Mine either. However, that does not mean that for those who have the ability to do so, climb that corporate ladder. You might end up CEO someday. You never know where you can go. Yeah, you just got to do your job, do what's asked of you, and you never know what tomorrow brings. It's never set in stone. The future is never set in stone. You have a seasonal job now, doesn't mean it's going to stay seasonal. You'll leave at the end of it. You'd be surprised how many people thought they were going to be let go at the end of seasonal. They were actually surprised that they actually got kept on. So anyways. That Wendy's I worked for yeah. all those years, mm-hmm. almost an entire decade. I started as a temporary part-time store opener. I ended up there for almost 10 years. And then they had to double their employee count just because one person was taking on the workload of 30. Literally, they had to double the employee count after he left. I know what the future is going to bring, people. You never know. The future is never set in stone. Are you going to hire the person? Are you going to hire the resume? Are you going to do your job or are you going to slack off? Exactly. Your career is what you make it. If you take it seriously and you take your everyday duty seriously and you exceed your manager's expectation, you're well on your way to climbing the corporate ladder. But if you're just going to goof off, you're going to act stupid. You're just going to pretend like that you don't have a boss and that you can just come to work and do whatever you want and play on your phone. Guess what? You're gone. Employees under me who did that, I would cut their jobs and I would make sure that they become not rehirable. I'll replace them with people who truly are serious. But yes, thank you guys for joining me and sharing all of your wonderful stories with us. I hope that the consumer world and the business world both learned a lot from them and I wish y'all the best. Thank you so much you, once Christian. again. Thank you for having us on again, Christian. Have a great day. Have a great rest of your week and have a great holiday season. Yes, you too. Thank you so much. Also, Christian, have a great holiday season. Until next time. Until next time.